or, or, or yeah, Larry really Fast. Fast. Oh, no, Larry Fast. I was briefly on on his uh, the same label with Larry. Uh, J Rainbow Delta was on. Yeah, same label he was on. I, I never met Larry. Um, and the other was when uh, Philip Glass, Beaver and Cross. You, Cross, you said something about them. Well, I engineered a couple of albums for Beaver and Cross. Uh -huh. um, they were they were done at different firm. Uh, there is one called, sorry, the new electronic guy. No, the the the, the guy to yeah. new electronic music. That's fantastic. That's the one I, I got a hold of. Yeah, back in the that, 80s. That, that, that was done before uh, I hooked up with those guys. They had done that already. Okay. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the names of the albums that I worked on. I worked on two albums for them. And then uh -huh. we were together, not happily, unfortunately, but we were together, Bernie and I, on the, the score for Apocalypse Now. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I, was, I was the head of the project, yeah. <laughs> according to... <clears throat> <clears throat> Francis Coppola, although some of the other musicians had a problem with that, of course. And um, Bernie was one of them. So he wasn't too happy with the fact that I was now his boss because when we first got together, I was this guy with this little studio in the Mission District that was really inexpensive that they could go record since there. And, and you know, Bernie was in effect, you know, in charge of, of the sessions that I was engineering. So the, the roles reversed and it was hard for Bernie. Um, so it, it, it didn't go as well as it could have, yeah. Do you have any particular recollections of, from your experience of working with Mr. Coppola back in those days? Like, oh, did, yeah. he, did he give you freedom? Was he all the time, uh, you know, pushing you well, to do something? It was a combination of both. You know, uh, he would, and it was very, and it was also very intuitive and very impulsive. I mean, uh, he was over listening to a cue I had done, I think one of the first cues, and he was just sitting there. And he said, you know, I want you to be in charge of this project, which was the first I'd ever heard of this. <laughs> and so then he wanted me, then he wanted me to, well, he, then he had a dinner and invited all the other synthesists. And then at the dinner, he introduced me to everybody else as if they didn't already know me, saying, this is basically the guy that's gonna be in charge of you. And some of the guys didn't like that very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. Could you mention a couple of them? Uh, like, uh, not, not because of the, you know, the problem that they, there, there was, but uh, some people that may, maybe we have some, seen some records by. Oh, sure. Um, Let's see, um, who's the, the guy that used to be with uh, uh, Frank Zappa? Um, ah, Patrick O'Hare? Hmm? No. Patrick O'Hare? No. No. The, Ian no. Underwood? No. Key, key, keyboard player that was with Francis, was with, with uh, okay. Zappa was with him. Uh, and uh, Shirley Walker, who was the, the piano player for the Oakland Symphony, who was also interested in synthesis. She and Bernie worked together and also, also unfortunately, they didn't get along. So, <laughs> so uh, it, was, it, was, it was a complicated uh, session. I, I, I'm not that crazy about the score because I think it had the wrong composer. Francis had his dad compose the score. Carmen. Yeah, and Carmen is a wonderful musician. Uh, he was Toscanini's flute player back in the day. And um, so, you know, you got to be pretty good to be Toscanini's flute player. And he had taken compositional lessons from some illustrious uh, 20th century teachers. But, you know, composing is a weird thing in a way you don't really teach anybody to, to, to compose. What you do is you help them to unfold what it is they already have to contribute. And if they don't have, at the end of the day, that to contribute, it doesn't matter how much unfolding you do or how much you expose them to, it's not gonna be that great. I felt, to be very frank, I felt Carmine was a mediocre composer. And of course, you know, since it was, Francis, dad, you didn't say that. But, but then I got kind of caught in a way between Francis and Carmine. And um, 
the guy who was the head of post-production because he hated Carmine's music. <laughs> and he called me up one day and he said, I want you to send that Dulong bridge cue over to me. I said, I already sent it to you. And he said, no, I want it on the 24 track. I said, well, wait a minute. You're in head of post-production, but I'm head of the music. So if you want something changed, tell me and I'll change it. But I don't want you to do the remix. So the guy said, well, you know, if, if, if that's the way it's going to be, the, the cue is not going to be in the movie. I said, fine. He said, well, look, at, can you at least get rid of that flute? And I said, well, Carmine had come in. We had finished the cue. Carmine came in, listened to it. Oh, we loved it and wanted to play his flute on it. So that's how the flute came to be there. He said, well, you got to get rid of it. So what I did was, since Carmine's a good musician, he can hear pitch probably faster than, better than non-musicians. So I made a white noise sort of dupe track that covered up the flute, but it had enough pitch left in it that Carmine could still hear it. So <laughs> Carmine listened to it and he felt the flute should be louder. I said, well, this is what they wanted and he just shrugged it was okay. <laughs> yeah. But it was a complicated s s score, socially speaking. I understand. Now, do, do you have any recollections, memories, nice memories of the guys with, of Devo, from Devo? Devo? Oh, yeah. Well, they were, they were, they were fun. They were, they were um, guys that Bruce Conner had yeah. discovered, the American painter and, and filmmaker. And Bruce said, well, you got to, the, the guys at, at Devo were dissatisfied. They'd been offered uh, a record contract from uh, Warner Brothers. And, um, and they were, they were, you know, they were young guys. They were arrogant and snotty. And they, they didn't think any offer was good enough. So they came to me because Bruce had recommended me and said, you know, you, you, you make us some music that we can sell, uh, that, that, you know, where it's, it's going to be the way we want it. I said, well, well, we can try it out. I'll, I'll produce a couple of demos and we'll see what happens. So I did that. I gave it to the folks at Mercury. And they said, yeah, well, we like this. And I said, well, how big will the advance be? They said, well, 25,000. I said, no, 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 no. I said, they've already got an offer for 125, which they've turned down. Sorry, let me just get rid of this. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, so they said, well, we could go to 75. I said, you know, they've already turned down 125. Why, why, why do you think going to 75 is going to make a difference? Well, try it. So we recorded the pieces, and of course, Mercury wouldn't come up, and Warner Brothers was already at 125, so they went with Warner's. And then, as it turned out, um, they used the two pieces that I had recorded. That Those pieces are on the two tunes I produced are on the final album. And at first, they didn't pay me for them. You know, they're the young rock and roll guys, you know, we can get away with this. <laughs> so, and then my lawyer called their management company and then they, they sent me a check. Good, good. Um, doctor, uh, I keep calling you Dr. <laughs> Patrick Gleason. Um, feel free to, and this is a good, a good topic also um, for the audience, may, may like the stuff. But uh, remember when you start doing kind of well, and then MOOC uh, 3 came along. Yeah. Obviously, it was very expensive. And you asked your dad and yeah. to lend you the money was 20 grand at the time. So a yeah. lot of money. A lot of CPA. money. So feel free to elaborate on, on what happened after that. Like, well, you know, he said, he said, I won't lend you the money. I said, okay. Then, I don't know if it was immediately or a day later. I think he talked with mom. They were very close. And he came back to me and he said, I won't lend you the money, but I will give you the money. Don't ever ask again. I said, great. So uh, that's what happened. And uh, at, at first when I went into music, my folks were just really upset with me. You know, they're Irish immigrants. They all, what, what do immigrant parents want? They want their kids to be doctors. Doctor, right? Yeah. So I fooled them. I became doctors, but as my mother complained, not a real doctor. I'm a PhD, which she didn't consider <laughs> to be a real doctor. So anyway, that that 
I don't, I can't remember where we were going with this, but. Um, yeah, and uh, he ended up lending you the money. And he, you ever, yeah. and th you did work very well financially. You mentioned that, you know, I think at one moment, at one point in your life, you were doing better than your dad, right? And yeah, my, my mother late in life, it was just oh, a few months before she died. She was in her 90s. And I'm sitting at the breakfast table with her. <laughs> and she, when she would get nervous, she would always take her, her fork and kind of, I don't know if you can see it on Line, but she would take a fork and kind of turn it a little bit like that back and forth nervously. So she's got the fork as she's turning it. She said, um, um, your, your, your dad um, has told me um, that he thinks uh, you make more money than he does. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know if that's true or not, but I thought, God, that's really a change, isn't it? Because at a certain point, I looked at my dad's, my dad always kept uh, a diary. And after he died, I looked back at his diary and in the early 70s, he had written, uh, Pat has broken his mother's heart. Oh, because I was into drugs and into, into music instead of you know, being a responsible citizen. <laughs> so, so for them to come around and, and think it was okay. And even at the end for my mother to say, this, <laughs> my dad thought I was a, more financially more successful than he was. I don't know if that was true, but I thought it was fun that she thought it might be true. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing also, I think it's important. At one point, you quit. I don't know. It was, I remember correctly, it was uh, the story with uh, your piano teacher that you want to, you discover jazz and, and you say, no, no, no I want to learn jazz. I want to learn jazz. And she say, no, right no, no, I'm, I'm teaching you classical music and you end up within music for like yeah. 15 years. Yeah, right? was, That's I was devastated about that. I mean, the, the, the situation was I had, you know, bad piano teachers. I mean, they were well-intentioned people, but they were not highly skilled or, or gifted. And yep. So I took piano lessons from them for eight years, and they were uh, they were nuns, Catholic nuns at our grade school. And then when I went to high school, I took lessons from uh, a, a man who I, the only interest he had in me was my five dollars a week. <laughs> and so I had this kind of amazing meeting. I won't go into the details of it, but. My, I had a hip cousin, and she set up this meeting between me and this uh, uh, African-American uh, musician, piano player, I, whose music I loved. He lived in Seattle. And, um, and she's, Mary had set it up because she thought, okay, we've got to get this kid over to doing the kind of music he wants to make. So she, the, whole, the meeting was a setup. I mean, I, I thought they all, we'd all just run into one another, but Mary had planned it. So then she asked the guy, she said, you know, would you ever take students? And he was a, a big, elegant man, looked a little bit like Oscar Peterson. And he, and he, he towered above me. He was like, you know, six foot three or something. He said, well, not usually, no. But why don't you fall by the pad and let's see what happens? I thought, fall by the pad and see what happens. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I run home, I tell my parents. This is a, you know, a reach for them. I mean, this, from their perspective, they were always slightly feeling that they felt a little bit sorry for the woman next door because her, her son was a violinist in the Seattle Symphony. <laughs> like this was a mark of shame. So you can see that the idea of their son becoming a jazz musician was not highly uh, appealing. So they, they kind of waffled on it and they said, we're not qualified, but we're gonna ask your piano teacher. This was this man who took my $5 every week. And he said, oh, not until he has completed the fundamentals. Well, I'd been taking piano for nine years. And I hadn't completed the fundamentals. And boy, we never complete the fundamentals. But, but you know, it just, it blew, and my parents said, no, that's it. Then, you know, you either don't have lessons at all or you have lessons with this man. I, I, I never want to see this guy again. So I didn't, I didn't make music for, gosh, 50, 14, 15, so 20, 20. Almost, almost 15 years. Wow, wow. 
Well, you, you did well in your life anyway, so yeah. it, it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, all's well and as well. That's right. Go ahead, Christian. <laughs> all right. Um, now, uh, Patrick, Mr. Gleason, uh, yeah, why yeah. are you, yeah, yeah, Patrick is good. Yeah. Okay. Or oh, Pat, uh, okay. your views, what are your views about technology in support of the artists and performers yesterday and today? You, you know, uh, how have things changed at the moment of creating, orchestrating, performing? Uh, yeah, the answer yeah. may be obvious, but I'd like to listen to hear it from you. That's a very interesting question. And I think that my fellow musicians, maybe me too, are going to have a hard time with the, the changes that are coming because when the synthesizer came in in the 60s, you know, that was very disruptive for many musicians. I mean, the guys in my own band didn't like what I was doing for months. Um, my, the first review But with me on record was Herbie's Crossings and the reviewer from Downbeat didn't mention me until the last paragraph. And then he did. He said, and about that synthesizer player, oh. the less said, the better. <laughs> that was the review. See, so, so mu musicians have had a hard time accepting technology before. Um, And, and I can understand why. I mean, at the end of the day, technology at the end doesn't necessarily help musicians or, or financially, certainly. I mean, if, if you think that's true, look at your royalties on Spotify. You know, oh, I, I made a dollar and 42 cents last year. <laughs> so, and unless you're, you know, a, a platinum selling act, you, this technology has not been kind uh, to musicians. So I think they're going to have a terrible time with this next one because what I see coming, I've, I've even delved into it a little bit, is uh, artificial intelligence composition and orchestration. I think it's coming faster than people imagine. I think what, what in, in 10 years, the experience of a, let's just say someone doing television or what do we have at that point that's a half hour to an hour of music. I think that the way that's going to be made is you, in some fashion or other, write up what it is that you want, and then you get back what artificial intelligence gives you, and then you tweak it. But I don't think, I don't think composition is going to be, I mean, you, you won't be able to compete with, with, artificial intelligence, they can do it, it'll be done too quickly. So I think that's going to be very hard on people. Um, and I, I also think that people say, well, yeah, but you know, we have live music and live performance. Well, that's going to continue to change. I mean, when people go to hear a Broadway musical now, half the music they hear is recorded. There's, there's an orchestra in the pit, but there's also a guy over there with Ableton Live feeding tracks into the live music. So it, it's going to be, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be, you know, I'd, I'd like to think of it being better. Technology will make lives better for musicians, but I, I don't think it will. Okay, now uh, maybe you can see the Plague Dogs soundtrack album. Uh, yes, I do. Yeah. yeah, do you remember those days? Uh, I never seen the movie because it, it would it never they never showed it in Chile. Well, so, yeah, but I, I like the music. You know, you know the reason they didn't sell it in Chile was it flopped. But it flopped for a very interesting reason. So, Martin Rosen was really the first Hollywood professional. Uh, director I'd ever worked with, at least of any consequence. And um, Martin was a very interesting guy. Uh, he's a friend of mine, 50 years later. In fact, we're going to be visiting them in, in uh, Marin County next month. Uh, but he, he had done this film before this um, that was this huge hit. And this, The Plague Dogs, was written by the same guy. So Martin's, when Martin took on the, the, the film, he was 
presumably going to be making an animation of the book. The book has a happy ending. The little dogs escape from the animal laboratory and they're chased and pursued, but finally they, they're able to get to someplace safe and be okay. Martin took a look at this and he said, no, the whole trajectory of the story, it's, 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 a, it's a protest book against uh, animal experimentation and how horrible it is for the animals. The whole trajectory is not a happy ending. It's, this, this is how bad this can be. So in Martin's film, the little doggies at the end are being pursued and they run to the sea and they jump into the water and they swim out as the sun is setting to their special island. They're on their way to their special island. And one of the dogs says to the other, I can see it now, but you know that it's a mirage. There is no special island and that the dogs are gonna die by drowning. It's very clear. <laughs> when, when I went to the, the uh, it wasn't the premiere, but one of the very early showings, and at the end of the film, the lights go up and there's, weren't, there weren't many people in the audience. And there's a mother and her son coming up the aisle. And the son is about eight or nine. And he's got his face buried in his mother's dress and he's sobbing. And she's saying, no, no, dear, it's, it's just a cartoon. Nobody really dies. <laughs> well, I, I think that what this kid found upsetting, the world found upsetting. So Martin's second film didn't, didn't do, uh, Watership Down was the name of the first one. It was a huge hit. And uh, the second one flopped, but it was a good film. And now people are beginning to realize that. I've heard re more favorable comments about it the last couple of years. Yeah. It was remember this? Sorry. Go ahead, I, please. I was just going to say, it was a fun score to do. I did it with the Kronos Quartet. And, oh, wow. And, yeah, and overdubbed uh, percussion and, and brass. Um, I, I really wanted a full orchestra, but there was no budget for that. And the Kronos were amazing. I mean, they had a big sound. And then what, what I did with them was I wrote parts, not for four violins, or four string instruments, but for 12. So they would overdub three times or overdub twice. They play their track and then overdub. So it was a big sound. And do you remember the, do you remember the song from uh, Watership Down? Who sang it? The beautiful song from Watership Down, Al Garfunkel? I don't, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Now, um, I, can't, I cannot leave the, miss the opportunity to ask you. I want to go back to the Departure for the Northern Wasteland album by Michael Hynek. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know this. I have to confess, I just, I, this is the first time I hear you were involved in the engineering aspect of the album. That's a, an album I really love. I think it's very much in the vein of Tangerine Dream, the Berlin School, so-called Berlin School, uh, sequ sequential type of music. Uh, any recollections, any memories about that, the sessions? Well, he had finished the album itself earlier, and then he came over to different fur uh, because he knew my interest in synthesizers. And we were going to do uh, a number of things that were going to make it more radio friendly. And I think what happened was as that process continued, Michael realized he was more interested in doing another album. So that's what we did instead. We did, did another album. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if that album was released because Warner Brothers, you know, they, they want big numbers. And I think what may seem like a hit if you're in our little niche of electronic music uh, is a failure in, uh, in commercial music today. I, I don't think you can, you can't keep an al a, a group on your, roster if they only sell 100,000 albums. You know, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to, to finish now with my, my questions, Patrick. I'd like to know what Mr. Patrick Leeson, Dr. Patrick Leeson does for fun and relax on a normal day. What music are you listening to these days? How do you relax and get disconnected from all the rest? Yeah, well, um, we only listen together as a family. I mean, there's just Charmaine and me. We, we only listen to music together, uh, really, um, while we're making dinner. And other than that, Charmaine has music going all day long in her office, which is right next door. But I don't because 
I can't do anything else and have music playing. I mean, if, if I'm listen, if music is playing, that's where my attention is going to go. It's mm -hmm. not entirely, it's not voluntary. It's just going to go there and nothing else is going to get done. So I, when I listen to music, I have to be working. I can't listen for fun, although I deeply enjoy it. Um, Something similar happens to me when music is playing. I cannot study, for example. I, I could never study with music. I, yeah. My attention went to music. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for the time, Patrick. Uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure and so much fun to hear about all those, you know, anecdotes and uh, knowing that finally Pat uh, Rainbow Delta is out. How yes. can we get a hold of that? I, oh, I'd like it, to. It's on BSS, excuse me, oh, BSX okay. Records now. Um, they, they had me sign a bunch of autographed albums, so to tell me you want an autographed album. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations for your fantastic career, and uh, enjoy your happy life, you and your wife, and the good music, and the good, you know, the good vibes. Thank you so much. Thank you, both of you guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Patrick, for your time for part two. Maybe we'll do a part three in the future. And uh, so, uh, also, I, I got an email. I remember, I I, I told you that before or not, but I, I interviewed Suzanne and uh, I was, I at the beginning, I didn't want to ask her directly. She can put me in touch with uh, Wendy Carlos. And uh, I got an email a couple of days ago that there might be a possibility. So I think uh, somebody, um, let's see, somebody, I don't know who the person is writing or finished writing hmm. an autobiography on Wendy Carlos. I think it's oh, done. Really? And, and of, you know, and of course, you know that, you know, Wendy Carlos has been, you know, out of the scene for many, many years. Yeah. You know, yeah. There is a person who kind of control everything that goes to her. So she, yeah. she may like to do interviews. She would like to do something, but, you know, her partner may say, no, 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 no. We don't, you know, don't, don't get involved with this. And that for sure. So I, I, as I say, I got an email from Suzanne and there is a possibility. I, w I will let you know if, 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 if something happens. You know, it's, uh, oh well, that'd be great. That would be, uh, that and um, and also I got a hold of one of the early person that worked with Wendy at the time. You you were working with Wendy Carlos, Rachel. Uh, yeah, Rachel. She's in France. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a very 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 stable person, right? So I. If I have to know twenty dollars, thirty or fifty, I, I will I, I will get my way. So <laughs> I, I get a I get a hold of somebody who knows her. So you know, you know, we'll we'll see. We'll we'll see what's happening. I will Good. have people there. Thank okay. you very much, Patrick. Uh, hope everything goes well with the Biophonic and uh, with your trio and hopefully we'll meet one day and uh, and have dinner or beer with Christian. That'd be great. And, uh, That'd be great. That be great. I want you to hear this album in quad. You gotta hear this quad album. We we will. Thank okay. you. Very much. Thanks again, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.